Okay, so in the second video, uh, we're going to think about uh, how an example of how errors propagate. I'm going to think about strain measurement uh, using diffraction. So in diffraction, we have some incident radiation, which is bouncing off the planes of our crystal. And if the outgoing beams constructively interfere, that is, if that extra path is a whole number of wavelengths, then we'll get a spot on our diffraction uh, detector over here. Um, so that, if we have an incident angle theta uh, and an outgoing angle theta, so the diffraction is diffracted through a total angle of two thetas, but we measure one theta, this extra path length is equal to sine, that bit's equal to d sine theta, where this is d and the wavelength of the radiation is lambda. Um, so we've got two of those extra path lengths um, and sine theta, and that's called Bragg's law. If we do a tensile straining experiment and we pull on this crystal and stretch the lattice planes, we're stretching the bonds and that's an elastic strain. So we can measure an elastic strain as being the variation in length, the L by L, but here we're talking about the lattice parameter or the plane spacing, so it's partial D by D. And that's a definition of strain. And we can use that to measure uh, strains in a sample and therefore determine a stress state or residual stress or something like that. Um, and that's very convenient. So um, if we want to do this, we need to measure um, the change in D, so D minus some strain-free spacing D0, um, at some stress. Um, and we need to know what partial D is. So if we differentiate Bragg's law, we can get an equation for it. So if I take the total differential of Bragg's law, I'm going to ignore the n, and I can say partial lambda is equal to 2 partial d sine theta, differentiate this and hold d, uh, so differentiate d and hold theta, plus then differentiate theta and hold d, so 2d differential of sine theta is cos theta, and I get a partial theta. Now, if I'm doing this with the same wavelength radiation all the time, that's equal to zero. Um, so my twos will cancel. I can pull this over the other side and I can say minus partial d sine theta is equal to d partial theta cos theta. I can bring the minus sign across and the d down and I'll have partial d by d is equal to minus uh, partial theta cos theta over sine theta which is equal to minus partial theta cot, 1 over tan, theta. So what I've got here is that my strain is equal to minus delta theta, the change in theta, cot theta. Very nice. That's a very nice little equation. Um, now, let's rub that off. Um, If I um, pick the radiation in my diffractometer, there's my sample, there's my ingoing beam, there's my outgoing beam and my detector. If I pick lambda such that um, uh, 2 theta is equal to 90 degrees, then theta will be 45 degrees, and tan 45 is 1. So that will disappear, and if theta is equal to 45 degrees, the strain will just be equal to minus delta theta. Very nice, very nice indeed, um, and therefore it's a very simple equation. So we can say that the strain is equal to theta naught minus theta. It will be theta minus theta naught, but there's the minus sign, so it's theta naught minus theta. Um, so the uncertainty in the strain, the uncertainty in the strain is then just given by from our propagation of errors equation in the last lecture, the square root of the uncertainty in theta our strained measurement squared, plus the uncertainty in theta naught squared. So what that emphasizes is that we should expend as much experimental effort on measuring theta naught as in measuring all of the, um, all of the points of different strains. We're aiming to map out a strain field and we measure theta at lots of different positions um, in our sample. We should expend as much effort on theta naught as we do on all the other measurements we can put together. Um, and then these will be about the same size and that will minimise the overall error 
um, in the uh, in the problem. Um, so that emphasizes that we should expend the maximum amount of experimental effort on measuring the, the strain free lattice spacing. So that's how error uncertainties work out, uh, error equations work out in practice. Now, just as we finish, I want to make a few notes briefly on um, doing experiments. Um, back at the dawn of modern science in the um, sort of early 1600s, Francis Bacon developed some guidance for um, doing scientific experimentation, which still stand. Um, and there are major defenses against uh, scientific fraud, malpractice. Um, and his uh, argument was that we should keep logbooks where we write every measurement down as we make it and precisely the measurement that we read. So, for instance, um, we should have a single clear running record, a single clear running record of our experiment, of the experiment. That is, it's timed and dated. It's sequential. Um, and when we're writing down numbers, we should record the actual number. So I'm reading my watch here, and it says it's 6.34 and 25 seconds. So that's 18.34.25. If I'm reading numbers off of a... Um, a machine that measures strain, but it measures it in millivolts, say, not in percents, and I have to do a conversion afterwards, I'd write down the measurement in millivolts in my table, measurement point two, three, four, write down all the numbers, and then I would leave a space to do the conversion afterwards. I wouldn't do it in my head, because if I got it wrong, I can always go back to these numbers and do it right. But if I do the conversion in my head as I'm going in the experiment and get it wrong, I can never go back. So you write down the actual number that you read off the machine. And that's very important. And it's tempting to take notes loose on pieces of paper and then copy them into a neat notebook later. And that's really bad practice. You shouldn't do it. And there's three reasons. One is, it's a massive waste of effort just to make a reasonably neat job of it in the first place. The second one is that it can introduce mistakes. And the third one is, this is your contemporaneous note of what you did at the time it records your thinking at the time and everything else. And that's your IP defense. That's what you write down, uh, would present um, if you have a challenge, your pattern or whatever. The other thing is that it's also, when you copy them into a neat notebook, it's almost impossible to avoid being selective in what you write down. And the data you discard might be important later. Um, and the selectivity and intent to get the right results might mean gives you a confirmation bias that you'll tend to confirm the hypothesis you have. Whereas actually, uh, you might subsequently decide that maybe it's wrong, and you need to go back and find all those points you thought were outliers that you now have decided they're important. So it's really important to avoid selectivity, and your defense against that is this contemporaneous, clear running record. And it might be right and proper to discard experimental artifacts, outlier points, and so on, but you should do it afterwards in the analysis. You shouldn't get rid of them altogether from history. They should still be there in your notebook to find. Uh, because our ideas change. The other thing is what we said about systematic and random errors. Um, so systematic offsets, you need to think about how to avoid those. Random errors are okay, you can eliminate those by repeated measurement. Um, so for instance, if you get, uh, you think your uncertainty is 0.01 uh, footballs, whatever your units are, and you measure five and six for the same thing. Well, they certainly should be point at once. They can't both be right. How do you decide which one's right? Well, you go and do a few more measurements. Maybe you measure 5.2, 5.4, 5.6, and so on. So the six point is obviously an outlier now once you've done lots of repeated measurements. And that's another hint as to how you decide if you've done enough measurements. If your uncertainty is now small, your points are all grouping together when you graph them, then you're sure that you've made enough measurements. Um, as we said, as a guide, you should quote experiments to uh, uncertainties to one significant figure and your data to no more precision than your uncertainty. Um, otherwise, it's just garbage. Um, the additional precision that you're writing down is a waste of ink, basically. And it's really annoying to the uh, reviewer and the marker, and you will be marked down for doing it. And if you do it in a journal article, you will get it rejected. Um, and in general, 
There is lots of good advice in this vein in Squires, and you should read Squires. It is a really good book, and it will really guide you through your career in doing good experiments. So that's it for this segment.